Uh, welcome to the 2022 Harvey Lecture, the first time in person in two years, I guess. Uh, we survived a tornado. Um, and we're all safe and sound and ready to hear something about faith, practice, and climate crisis. Just so as a way of introduction, the Harvey Lectures were conceived at Seminary Southwest as a way of honoring the late Dean Hudnall Harvey, who died unexpectedly in 1972 after serving as a seminary's dean for only five years. During that time, he oversaw a real revitalization of the seminary, setting it on new directions and a healthy course. The seminary community established the Harvey Lectures as an annual series that would be overseen by student leaders, and that would address the relationship between pastoral leadership and contemporary issues confronting the church. And over the years, these lectures have become a lasting and vital resource for the seminary, bringing important and diverse theological voices to our campus. As the faculty advisor and dean of community life, I've seen the students here work very hard. I'm very thankful for all who made this possible, and that planning team will be leaning later and introduced. And so now I would, though, would like to introduce the Reverend Julius Rodriguez as the event's MC and take it away. Now, before we get started, I would like to go over a few housekeeping matters. So restrooms are outside the main entrance, out these back doors, um, emergency exits, back doors, and these side exits. Um, but we just lived through a tornado warning, and I want you to be aware that in case anything arises again, this is a designated tornado shelter, so you are safe here. We will shelter in place here, and our communications director, Eric Scott, will be monitoring the situation, so no worries. The lecture will be followed by a Q&A conversation in that lovely sitting area between two ferns. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and following the Q&A, we will have a dessert reception in the dining hall, and please join us for that. And finally, we, due to the storm conditions, we ask that you disconnect from the SSW Wi-Fi so that it will help our digital connections for the event stay intact. Today's lecture is titled, One Person, One Step, Faith Practice in Climate Crisis. As we have all experienced, like just now, and heard on the news of extraordinary climate events around the world, such as severe wildfires, flooding, increased intensity of storms, like blizzards, hurricanes, and tornadoes, increased droughts, melting glaciers, warming oceans, and the human cost of increased poverty, homelessness, food insecurity, and climate refugees, and so on. So what is our faithful response to this climate crisis as the people of God? Our speaker today is a leader in the intersection of Christianity and sustainable agriculture. She is the executive director and co-founder of Plainsong Farm and Ministry in Rockford, Michigan. Plainsong Farm is an experiment in environmental practices, ecumenism, and discipleship. She is passionate about helping people see that growing and sharing food are not tangential to faith, but its core. She's the author of the book, Resurrection Matters, Church Renewal for Creation's Sake. She's a graduate of Harvard Divinity School and a priest in the Episcopal Church. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the Reverend Nuria Love Parrish. Good evening. It is an honor to be with you tonight. When I received a letter from the students of the seminary inviting me I, to become this year's Harvey lecturer, honestly, tears came into my eyes. I have been uh, in ministry since I was called by God at 19, and I am 51. And when I look back on the journey that I've had so far, it's clear 
that most of the time I have not known where I was going. <laughs> I have been trying and sometimes failing to keep taking one step forward in faith every day. And what I hope to do tonight is to give an honest accounting of the practice of faith as I have experienced it. Both theory, I, I kind of feel embarrassed about the fact that there's quite a bit of theory here, uh, but also it, it's important, um, and also practice. I'm just one person, and each of you is one person, and I hope that hearing about my path helps you to discern your own. I'm, I'm doing a little preamble. This is the preamble. <laughs> um, so tonight, this lecture is going to be in three parts, and in there's time to uh, stand up, breathe, and reflect in between. If you have a piece of paper or a phone or a friend, um, I'm a little worried that I have too many words, so I'm probably only giving you a minute in these times, but um, I want you to have a minute to digest and reflect. And I also want to have you stop and move and breathe, because we are not just brains in this room, we are bodies. And that matters as we think about climate and faith. So I also, before I pray, have one more piece of preamble, um, which are two dedications. I want to dedicate this lecture to my mother, who may or may not be watching. <laughs> she, when I was too young to walk, she carried me around the backyard to say good morning to the plants. That's right. Made a compost pile and took care of it when nobody else had one and gave me a strong foundation for loving my place in creation. And she's been one of my song friends, major supporters, and I would not be here without her. And I ask you to join me in praying for healing for her as she's recovering from illness right now. And I also want to honor the Reverend Canon William Spade late of the Diocese of Western Michigan, whose work welcomed me into the ordination process of the Episcopal Church. He passed away yesterday. Without him, I would also not be here. And so as I stand here, I give thanks for the ancestors, known and unknown, living and those who have gone on, who have led me and us into this moment. The Lord be with you. Also, also with you. Let us pray. <clears throat> Holy One, you breathe throughout creation. From before time, you are God. Thank you for the grace you show in Jesus Christ, healer of all creation. Thank you for making us one with him through the water of baptism, nourishing our souls at his table, making us witnesses his love. In the time we share, give us insight into the steps that you would have us take, each and all. May the speaking be honest. May the questions be bold. May we be humble together, because you have made us your servants for the sake of the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So for this first part of this lecture, I want to share a little of my own story so you know something about my ministry at a human level. Dancing with this microphone, how's it working? Sure. Okay, I'm here as an inadequate witness to the love of God in Christ. And first, I have to say that for the first like 20 years of my life, no one would have ever expected me to say the words, I am here as an inadequate witness to the love of Christ, because I was not raised that way. I am an adult convert to Christianity. I became a Christian in part because of the ecological crisis at the heart of contemporary life. I was born in 1971. I was raised in Las Vegas, Nevada. My parents had moved there as so many people move, looking for a job for my father. In those days, does anybody know anything about the ecology of Las Vegas? Depends on Hoover Dam, Lake Mead. In those days, unlike today, Lake Mead was full. And in my front lawn, there was a lush green lawn. So this is the ecology of Las Vegas. It is a desert. This, however, is the ecology of a lawn. And when you put them together, it does not make sense. 
And that is what I saw at a young age. I realized that my lawn did not make sense. It was not going to last. This was still the 70s. They actually outlawed lawns in Las Vegas at some point still in the last century. But I remember thinking, why did the adults bring me here? <laughs> How come they thought this would work? <laughs> and I remember deciding I would leave Las Vegas as soon as I could and find a wiser place to live because I figured probably during my lifetime, Las Vegas would be fine. But if I stayed there and then I had kids and if my kids had kids and they stayed there, then someday when Las Vegas stopped working, people would suffer and in part it would be my descendants because of my choices. I lived in that house with the lawn and the ecology until I was 15 and one of the ways that I mm, tried to understand life without a, any religion is I started reading Madeleine Lengel. Excellent Episcopal woman. I didn't really understand that at the time, but I remember standing on that lawn, looking at desert mountains and remembering the words, I lift mine eyes to the hills, from whence is my help to come? My help cometh from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. And at that time, those words were to me a foreign language. We never left that house where I grew up to go to any community of faith of any kind in any tradition. My parents had their own varieties of religious trauma, which are beyond the scope of this lecture. What I learned from people like Madeline Lengel was all I knew about Christianity for a very long time. I uh, went to the Unitarian Universalist Church out of curiosity when I was 19, had a profound call, an unexpected call to very profound and very unexpected call to ordain ministry, <laughs> and then ended up going to seminary, and seminary was where I discovered Christianity. It, it should not be that hard to find Christianity where it's okay to ask questions. But once I found a kind of Christianity where it was okay to ask questions, I got baptized. And I can trace a direct line from the moment when I stood on that lawn thinking, this doesn't make sense, to the moment when water was poured on me and I was baptized in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because at a profound level, that moment on my front lawn was an awakening to the brokenness of the world. And I was looking for wisdom. And I knew I didn't have that wisdom within myself. I could see what was broken, but I couldn't see how to bring healing. When I was baptized, it was with the knowledge that I, I still didn't have the wisdom I needed. But by saying yes to Jesus and saying yes to the Christian tradition, I was finding a wellspring of life that had endured across generations. I believe then, and I still believe now, despite everything I'm going to say to you in part two, that this tradition holds the hope, <laughs> the promise of hope and of healing. Now, so far, what I hope to convey is that I was pretty young when I started being aware about our ecological crisis. And I've also hoped to convey that for me, my practice of faith in part is a direct response to that ecological crisis. Now, I have a couple questions for you. When did you become aware of our current ecological crisis? Was there a moment? And how is your practice of faith related to that awakening? I'm going to try to set a timer for one minute and then you'll hear a chime. When did you become aware of our current ecological crisis? Is there a moment where you became aware? And do you see a way that your current practice of faith is connected to that moment?
the chime is very quiet, so I don't know how effective that was. Hopefully you noticed that you were breathing. I want to invite you also to stand up and be a body. And breathe. Stretch, I see some stretching. Stretching is good. It's late. We had a tornado warning today. It's kind of challenging. <laughs> we practice faith in our bodies. And I invite you to sit down. So this is this this next part is the long section. This is when we talk about what's wrong and why it's wrong and how our faith is connected both to the world's brokenness and to our faithful response. So when I was a child in Las Vegas, I had questions about whether a lawn in a desert was a problem all by itself or whether it was connected maybe to some bigger problems that adults had also created. And I no longer have those questions. Um, also, I have a much longer perspective on history, as you are going to understand shortly. We are here today because we know about those bigger problems. There are many ways to describe the climate crisis, and all the words fall short. And since I'm assuming that most of you would not be sitting here if you did not know something, I'm not actually going to spend a whole lot of time talking about what is going on in climate and what the impact of it will be. But I want to at least give you a view into a, a change. So this is from NASA, and it is a shift in temperature from 1880 to today. So you'll see on the top left that on the blue side, things are cool, and yellow and red means that there's warming that goes very quickly through history. This actually stops in 2018. I regret to say that it has continued and gotten warmer since. And we know that there are consequences for all creation. The time frame began in the 1880s because the Industrial Revolution was not that much before in 1880s when we started being able to measure things like global temperature. But the consequences that we see are global, significant, and will most affect the most vulnerable. I think we're all here knowing that and trying to understand what we do in the face of it. And this is a list of worldwide scientific organizations that goes by a kind of a fast clip, all of whom have said, this is a human-caused this is not a natural um, shift in temperature that just happens to occur because of our moment in history. This situation that we find ourselves in with temperatures rising is due to our actions as humans. So I've been talking and we're still only on the ends. I'll let you keep going with me through all of these organizations that have all made this statement. So it's bad, we're part of it, what next? Even knowing about these bigger problems, even as disciples of Christ, even as inheritors of the legacy of the Episcopal Church, we too often fail to connect the dots between the scripture, our history, our current ecological crisis, and our future. And you know, I, I have about 45 minutes, so I thought I'd try that. <laughs> When we consider the teachings of our faith, we can't be surprised about our current ecological crisis because of the stories that we inherit from our ancestors that are found in Genesis 2 and 3. Are you familiar with these stories? There's a garden involved. So this story has everything we need. I mean, it's one of the many stories in scripture that has everything we need where we read God formed man out of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, the man becomes a living being, and God plants a garden and takes the man and puts him in the garden to till it and to keep it. Our first parents, as attested to in scripture, 
are Adam, which means earth, human, which is connected to humus, Adam, which is connected to Adama in Hebrew, earth, and Eve, which means life, earth and life. That's what our story tells us that we come from. They're surrounded by an abundant garden, the life of which sustains their own, and given the purpose of caring for that garden. There's plenty to eat and no reason to be afraid. They understand little and enjoy much. And as the Jewish farmer and teacher Nati Passau says, in the Garden of Eden, God places the human, Adam, formed from the earth, Adama, to work it and protect it. And God says, there is so much abundance in this garden for you. All I ask is that you show the tiniest bit of restraint. <laughs> yeah. But you know what happens in the story, I'm assuming, because we're here at a seminary. Someone who makes false promises offers them the chance to be more like God. They show no wisdom. They attempt to be more like God. And in doing so, they trespass against the boundaries God has set for them. In trespassing against God's boundaries, first they experience shame and fear. Then God explains their consequences, sets new boundaries, and sends them out of the garden to make a harder life in a more challenging world. So it's an old story, but it's also today's story. We are still the ground walking. I think we've heard, maybe even recently, that we are dust and to dust we shall return. As the scientists teach us, we are carbon-based life forms, and to carbon we shall return. Ooh. The soil holds carbon, and the breath of life that God gives us dwells in us until the day it does not, and we are laid to rest in the earth from which we come. During our lifetimes, we still have the purpose of caring for the garden of life that sustains us. And we are still trespassing against the limits God gives us. You offered me a wonderful invitation, which I gratefully accepted to be this year's party lecturer. In order to deliver this lecture on the ecological crisis we face and our faithful response, I flew here in the sky on a plane. <laughs> According to the carbon offset calculator found at myclimate.org, your invitation and my acceptance of that invitation created 0.794 tons of carbon dioxide emissions. To stop climate change, and this is in that same source, every person on Earth needs to contribute only 0.6 tons of these emissions per year. Doing this put me over that limit. I am a sinner, I, we know this already, but I have to say it out loud and confess it and begin again. You invited and I accepted because we made a considered calculation that the benefit of this experience would outweigh the cost. It was my hope that by coming and speaking in Texas, I could contribute to change at a national level. I don't know what your hope was, but I, I hope it was well-intentioned. <laughs> but, you know, what if we are wrong, as Adam and Eve were wrong before us? If we are wrong, we are not going to be the first people to be wrong. Being wrong has been part of the human experience for as long as there have been humans. And today we see the evidence in that temperature change that our society was founded on certain fundamentally wrong principles. God makes no accounting errors. God also does not do accounting in money, but that's a different lecture. <laughs> and the consequences of human choices are being reckoned even now. In this context, how do we practice Christian faith? We can't, I should pause now, that's a poignant question. In this context, how do we practice Christian faith? Now, I'm about to cover a lot of church history poorly in a few paragraphs. Because I think for us to answer that question, we have to understand something of the legacy we inherit as church. <coughs> and that is a legacy that is connected to the legacy of Jesus Christ, but also departs somewhat from the legacy Christ intended to leave. We know his story, this is a seminary, it begins in a specific place on earth, a land so sacred to so many, Lost my scarf. It's not a good sign. <laughs> In that specific place on earth, it is so sacred to so many that it is a dangerous place to live. 
And as we pick up the story of this place in our Holy Scripture, we know it's named after a man called Jacob, a descendant of Abraham and Sarah, an ancestor to many. What is his other name? Very well done. You, I, I don't have the capacity to give any grades here. <laughs> his descendants became a nation that perseveres to this day, a nation called Israel. Jesus Christ was born into and belonged to this ancient people all the days of his earthly life. And in the years after his death and resurrection, both Jewish and Gentile people acknowledged him as God and were baptized in his name. And then, you know what happened? They were persecuted. They were martyred. From Stephen, whose death is attested to in the book of Acts, through Perpetua and her companions and many people that you probably observe regularly, here, um, as we, you honor them in your chapel. Perpetua and her companions were sentenced to death in the year 203 for the crime of preparing to be baptized. To be a Christian at the beginning of the life of the church was to risk one's life. So it must have been a wonderful day, or seemed like a wonderful day. I would have thought it a wonderful day when the Emperor Constantine became tolerant of Christianity and even more amazing when Theodosius proclaimed Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire in 380. Instead of being persecuted for their faith by the government, dying in solidarity with Christ, who was killed by the state and then rose from the grave, disciples of Jesus became friendly with monarchs. And emperors began to consider themselves protectors and defenders of Christian faith. And it would be hypocritical of me to lament this, because I like being alive. <laughs> but there were unanticipated consequences for this new level of physical safety. Over the next thousand, thousand years and shifting political contexts, monarchs across Europe took on Christian faith, and the church in the West consolidated power. And it seemed to them eventually that since God had created the world and come in Christ to redeem the world, and since Christ had given authority to the church to teach God's ways and to the monarch to govern according to God's ways, they spoke for God. Time passed. About a thousand years ago, there were wars fought by Christians and Muslims to control places, sites that were holy to both traditions. Those wars were fought by church and state working hand in hand. And by the 1400s, these words were written by Pope Nicholas. The Roman pontiff successor of the key, I had to put it on a slide because if I just read it to you, it's gonna, it's really long sentences. The Roman pontiff successor of the key bearer of the heavenly kingdom and vicar of Jesus Christ contemplating with a father's mind all the several climes of the world and the characteristics of all the nations dwelling in them, and seeking and desiring the salvation of all, wholesomely ordains and disposes, upon careful deliberation, those things which he sees will be agreeable to the divine majesty, and by which he may bring the sheep entrusted to him by God into the single divine soul, fold, and may acquire for them the reward of eternal felicity and obtain pardon for their souls. This, we believe, will more certainly come to pass through the aid of the Lord if we bestow suitable favors and special graces on those Catholic kings and princes who, like athletes and intrepid champions of the Christian faith, as we know by the evidence of the facts, not only restrain the savage excesses of the Saracens and other infidels, referring to those earlier holy wars in which the Muslims and Saracens were the same, but also for the defense and increase of the faith, vanquish them and their kingdoms and habitations, those situated in the remotest parts unknown to us, and subject them to their own temporal dominion, sparing no labor and expense, in order that those kings and princes, relieved of all obstacles, may be the more animated to the prosecution of so salutary and laudable a work. In other words, under the authority God has given me as Pope, I say, you should subjugate the peoples in far off lands by violence so that they might confess Christ and gain eternal life. This is a moral good, go forth and conquer. This papal bull and others like it began the colonial era. 
And the actions undertaken during that era were reminiscent of those Adam and Eve took in the garden. Europeans traveling the globe got confused about what was theirs and what was God's. They wanted always more, more peoples, more lands. Seeking always more, they did harm to themselves and to people and to the world. The same decisions followed to cross boundaries, seek power, claim space. And now those decisions were made in the name of the church. It was said by people professing faith in Jesus Christ that God's will was served by conquering and subjugating other nations. And we now call it the doctrine of discovery. And I, I apologize for all of you who whom this was reviewed. I'm not an expert in this era in history, but even a cursory exploration of these questions makes clear that those decisions, decisions that we as church inherit, those decisions made by kings and popes and bishops hundreds of years ago in places far away, shape the world that we live in today. As the World Council of Churches has pondered this, they have stated, and I quote, I didn't put this on a slide because it seemed clearer. The church documents Dum Diversus in 1452 and Romanus Pontifex in 1455 called for non-Christian peoples to be invaded, captured, vanquished, subdued, reduced to perpetual slavery, and to have their possessions and property seized by Christian monarchs. And following these patterns of thought and behavior, Christopher Columbus was instructed, for example, to discover and conquer, subdue and acquire distant lands. England's King Henry VII followed the pattern of domination by instructing John Cabot and his sons to locate, subdue, and take possession of the islands, countries, regions of the heathens and infidels unknown to Christian people. And in 1823, the United States Supreme Court used that pattern and paradigm of domination to claim in the ruling Johnson Graham's Yassi versus McIntosh that the United States has the successor to these various potentates, had the ultimate dominion or ultimate title over all lands within the claimed boundaries of the US. And as a result of those documents mentioned above that gave Christian people the right to discover and possess the lands of heathens, the indigenous people of the Americas were left with a mere right of occupancy. An occupancy that was subject to the ultimate title of the United States. And that case has been cited repeatedly by Australian and Canadian and New Zealand and United States courts. And the doctrine of discovery has been held by all these countries to have been granted European settler societies plenary power over indigenous peoples and legal title to their lands. I don't have time to explain how this was connected. I also don't, wouldn't do a great job explaining how this exact way of thinking is also undergirded the slave trade. European Christianity tied to empire changed the world 500 years ago and shape the world we know today. Now you might be thinking, I thought I was here for a lecture on climate change. <laughs> Instead, I somehow seem to be hearing a lecture on church history. And the answer to that is yes. It is the sin of a church wed to empire and committed to domination. A church which got tragically confused about the meaning of Holy Scripture and practices of discipleship that began our climate crisis. Our ancestors in faith didn't know what they were doing. Like Adam and Eve in the garden, they intended good, but they made a deep and profound strategic error in advancing the mission of Christ. The treatment of indigenous persons matters to the climate crisis because to be an indigenous person is to have a sense of belonging to a place to inherit wisdom from ancestors that lived in that place before you, to tend that place knowing that your descendants who come after it will also live there. I am not an indigenous person, but it is my hypothesis that if you are indigenous, you don't need to be told not to plant a lawn in the desert. <laughs> 
The Europeans who set out as agents of monarchs blessed by popes to conquer and subdue the peoples of Africa and the Americas, the people who began the process of creating the colonial world, they were indigenous to somewhere. But where they landed, they were settlers and strangers. And what they were told to do was not to love places, but to subdue them. Not to love people, but to own them. And they thought this was discipleship. But that's not what the scripture teaches. The whole teaching of Holy Scripture is that the world was made in and through Jesus Christ, and in him all things cohere. To violently subjugate people in places is antithetical to the work of Christ. He breathes life into all. Monarchs and presidents, for strategic reasons having to do with their understanding of their people's place in history, do make decisions to own and control other people. I think we're reading that in the headlines. But Jesus Christ, in whom all things already cohere, and to whom all things already belong, is not someone who overpowers others by force or violence. Jesus Christ accepted death at the hands of religious leaders and the state and rose again from the dead. He rose from the dead to show the power of God, which cannot be conquered by the powers of the world. But we inherit both things, the poor choices of those who went before us thinking they professed faith and practiced it, and the wise choices of those who handed down the sacred stories showing that they actually were. The way Europeans thought back then has been inherited across generations all the way through to contemporary example, Ralph Trolliner of Capital Ministries, who interprets scripture today to say, in God's hierarchy of creation, man is a top and is to rule over all of creation and subdue it. Notice these words, rule and subdue, they define how man is to operate in his preeminent role within creation. This organization has a lobbying agency in the name of Jesus on the capital of our country. This is lawn in the desert thinking. It is at the root of the climate crisis today. Now I said this before, but it's worth saying again, being wrong is part of the human experience for as long as they are thinking this. And when you see that you're wrong, or when you see wrong done by your ancestors, there's only one thing to do and we do it, we practice it as Episcopalians, which is one of the things I love about this church. You confess, and you begin again, and you trust in the grace and mercy of a loving God. And that is what we are here to do. So the Episcopal Church repudiated the doctrine of discovery formally in 2009. I have children older than that repudiation. <laughs> we have not even begun to wrap our minds around what this repudiation means in our practices of discipleship. So one question I have for you, leaders of the church now and tomorrow, because you have to do the experiments to answer this question, as I am trying to do some experiments to answer this question. What does it mean to practice discipleship? in a church that repudiates the doctrine of discovery. I think one way we begin is by honoring the reality that our holy book reflects customs and stories of an indigenous people, not indigenous to the Americas, they're indigenous to ancient Israel. They wrote down the wisdom that sustained them. They wrote down the knowledge that they were made of the soil of the earth. They wrote down rhythms of life that embody hope like Sabbath, like Jubilee. I'm not saying they actually practice Sabbath and Jubilee. I know there's a professor here somewhere that's going to tell me they didn't. But guess what? <laughs> they told us they did it themselves in the words of the prophet saying, hey, you people, practice Sabbath, practice Jubilee. You aren't doing it, but if you did, things would be different. 2,000, 3,000 years later, I don't know how many, that's a long time. I'm still saying these same things. These rhythms teach what indigenous wisdom teaches everywhere, that we belong to a creator 
that the earth belongs to a creator, that we belong to the earth. Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. To believe this is to be transformed into someone whose life is for God in a broken world. And that's the purpose of a life of discipleship. We don't just get that story from the Garden of Eden. We don't just get that story of temptation that leads to destruction. We have another temptation story. We know it, right? Because we're in Lent. Do we remember? We are gifted the story of Christ in the desert, and it unfolds very differently. It's almost exactly the first story reversed. So in the desert temptation, the unholy one shows up again. And those false promises that are offered have an echo of Eden. One more time, the unholy one tells a human that they can be like God. But this time, that empty promise is refused. The power to fly? No, thank you. The power to make food from dust? No, thank you. Everything, all the kingdoms of the world? No. I'm being a little bit more polite, I think, maybe, than Jesus was. <laughs> he just says, no. In the story from Genesis, the humans are not God, but they seek the power of God. In the book of Luke, that is our inheritance as members of the body of Christ, the human being is God, but declines to act with God's power chooses human limits. Now the challenge is discerning the boundaries that God has set. Whereas I, I have heard from God a few times, but I, I don't like have specific details for you. <laughs> In the Garden of Eden, the snake appears friendly, right? Uh, Invitations to fly on planes are so friendly. I appreciate them so much. <laughs> the purveyors of lawn in the desert, the founders of Las Vegas, Nevada, they were looking for people's well-being. They were just confused about what well-being was. All these stories, the story of Genesis and the story of Luke, are about choices and consequences, life and death, the world as we know it. And one opens our eyes, hopefully, to the ways that we trespass against God's boundaries. And the other, hopefully, shows us a way out of the trap that the snake sets and shows us the way of life, which is embracing limits. We all make choices every day, and we all have temptations. And what we need to be mindful of as we think about discipleship in the era of climate crisis, and you're already mindful of this, is that we're not the ones that are going to receive the consequences of our choices. Those consequences will be for those who come after us. We have to remember, Cain and Abel never experienced the Garden of Eden. We are contributing ever more to the world of Cain and Abel, a world where brothers kill each other because they perceive that resources are scarce and there is only enough for one. There's an author called Hope Jarin. She actually moved to Norway after running a lab in the United States. Has anybody heard of her book called The Story of More? It is readable, engaging, and insightful on the climate crisis. And if you know the stories of scripture, the whole book is commentary on those two stories of scripture that I just cited, these two gardens. By the end of the book, Hope makes clear that human beings today need to live on average the way human beings lived, she says, in Switzerland in 1965. Okay. Or also the way plenty of people live today in continents other than Europe and North America. We need to stay home more and drive and fly less. We need to eat and live regionally instead of depending on supply chains and food systems. 
that use fossil fuels to cross continents and oceans. We need to live, live seasonally. When it is cold, we need to be colder. My husband, who always wants to set the thermostat colder than I do, I don't think is listening to this lecture. <laughs> yeah. I'm not saying that I have all of this sorted out in my own brain. Uh, I'm just saying I, I'm aspiring in a direction. Because remaking the world for our comfort and convenience is unmaking the world godly and trespassing against those boundaries. This is work that starts in our brains and rethinking our lives so they fit more easily within the boundaries of God's garden. There's an economist named Kate Rayworth who makes this point plain in her book called Donut Economics. This is kind of the main graphic. In Donut Economics, um, she posits that there is a livable economy for all human beings, and its outer limit is this planet's carrying capacity, an ecological ceiling, and its inner limit is the provision of the basic needs of all people, a social foundation that creates a stable, nonviolent society. And the urgent work of the present generation is finding a middle ground. We don't inherit it from our ancestors. We seek to leave it for our descendants. And let's be honest, it's multi-generational work. And in this process, the world needs the church to be the church. We need to interpret the gospel of Jesus Christ and seek to embody it in our own lives and talk about how it's hard and how we're loved and how we're starting over again tomorrow. God has given us the Holy Spirit through the power of baptism so that we might continue the work of Christ in the world as members of his body. The choice to wed church and state, the choice to promulgate the doctrine of discovery, arose at moments in history in response to events in history. And now we are at another moment in history where all those horrible headlines are events in history. And as Hope, said, Hope Jaron says, we are just as noble and frail and flawed and ingenious as the people who cured and dared and built and forged centuries ago. If we can refrain from overestimating our likelihood of failure, then neither must we underestimate our capacity for success. And I think overestimating our likelihood of failure is probably the cardinal sin that we have among us today. The climate crisis is so great, and I am so small, and what can I do? I can't do anything. I might as well do nothing. That is not discipleship. I found my aunt's uh, godmother's baptism certificate while I was preparing for a talk I gave in Arkansas before the pandemic. And I, I put it in this because I love what it says baptism does for us. In baptism, we have become a member of Christ, the child of God, and the inheritor of the kingdom of heaven. What we inherit at baptism is everything that we need a member of Christ in whom, through whom all things were made and in whom all things cohere. The child of God, an inheritor of the kingdom of heaven. This doesn't have anything to do with the ownership of people. It doesn't have anything to do with the ownership of places. What it has to do with is belonging and renewal. We are meant to die to this world, to become alive in Christ day by day. And that is a journey we take one step at a time. Each of us is one person, and each is called to one step. And in the next section, I will share more of the story of the steps I have taken as food for thought for you, as you ponder how God calls you ever forward. And now I'm gonna invite you once more to stand up and stretch and move around. And as you do, I ask you to consider whether anything I have said in this section strikes you as wrong, because I too could be wrong. If so, I hope you will let me know in the Q&A. And I ask you to consider your feelings, because we're motivated to action often not just by our intellect, by our feelings. How do you feel 
hearing what I have said so far. This time I invite you to find someone, I'm gonna only give you 30 seconds because that clock says 728 and everybody wants to sleep tonight. <laughs> um, so my chimes will go off again in a minute. of my story um, as it has led to the development of Plain Song Farm and new ministry in the Episcopal Church. This ministry began following a logic of the gospel, I hope, in contrast to the logic of empire. So if the logic of empire is domination and control, a logic through which mortal humans claim ownership of people and places and seek to reshape those people and places in their own image, the logic of the gospel is not that. It is the recognition that not even my own life is my own, and certainly nothing that belongs to me. It's all God's, and how I manage it is a matter of you know concern and attention, but fundamentally, it isn't mine. In 2001, my husband and I were newlyweds. I was much younger, and we bought a farm. It didn't look like this then. In this picture, it looks like a farm. That's because we took this picture after it became Plain Song Farm. But the house was there and those barns. In Western Michigan at the time, this was a fairly normal thing for relatively middle-class descendants of European settlers to do. And so it was not, uh, I don't know how real estate is in Austin. At the <laughs> <laughs> It's bad in West Michigan now also, but 20 years ago, this was an affordable, my husband had a, he was a firefighter and I was half-time employee maybe, and we weren't sure I was going to be employed. So on a firefighter salary, you, you bought a farm. Um, so by the time I was 30, I was partly responsible for this mortgage on a house built in 1914 and 10 acres, a large old barn, a smaller barn. And honestly, we bought this farm because we had read a lot of Wendell Berry. <laughs> and you know, it's a common delusion among people who read a lot of Wendell Berry that they might become farmers. <laughs> For us, this turned out to not be true, but we were young and we didn't understand that yet. In the early 2000s, uh, Barbara Kingsolver hadn't yet published Animal, Animal Vegetable Miracle, and Michael Pollan hadn't yet published Omnivore's Dilemma. Food systems and their environmental connections were largely undiscussed. I thought that I was interested in these things because I just had a really weird hobby. So I was interested in these things though because of my lawn in the desert moment. And so I hunted out conferences and books about agriculture and the environment. And as I did, I started noticing a few things that disturbed me. I noticed but when I went to sustainable agriculture conferences, I was getting older. 10 years after I was the curious young person, other curious young people were showing up. I was becoming the middle-aged person. This did not happen in my world of church. 
I noticed that at church, even as I aged, I continued to be among the youngest people. I don't know if this is true in the Diocese of Texas, but the data shows that the average age in the Episcopal Church is 60 and above. And there is absolute, I love people that are 60 and above. And I also love people that are 50 and below. <laughs> In my diocese in Western Michigan, we very much reflect the overall data of the Episcopal Church. I, I have been called kiddo in my diocese while I was over 40. So not being from church originally, it took me a while to figure out that once upon a time, older generations had not seen the departure as of younger generations as concerning or existential. They had anticipated that someday these young people were going to come back because that's how it worked. That's what they thought. But the people didn't come back. I mean, starting in my generation, I'm Generation X and beyond, had decided that participation in religious community was optional. It was not essential. And honestly, in a church too far, too far aligned with empire, they did have a point. But I looked around the Episcopal Church, my adopted community of discipleship, and I had the same instinct to overwhelm me as I had in Las Vegas, looking at the lawn in the desert. Someday this is going to stop working. So as I was going to the sustainable agriculture conferences, however, I noticed that that was addressing these climate issues, addressing the ecological issues, and also engaging younger generations. And I was living on this farm, and I had become uh, connected to Benedictine spirituality, which puts at its core a commitment to place and stability. And over time, as I lived in this place, that little yellow house, God started to call me to see the place where I was living as a place where God could work. I decided it would call, be called Plain Song Farm because of that vow of stability taken by Benedictine monastics. Benedict, who lived before anything related to the doctrine of discovery ever existed. All I had was that name. I did not have a clear vision of how it would work. I did not know what its programs would be, and I definitely did not have a business model. <laughs> Thank you forever. Whoever laughed, you understand. <laughs> but what I did have was this incredible, overwhelming, it grew more and more overwhelming over time, a sense of vocation, that somehow my life was wrapped up in this work, whatever it was, to the point that by like 20, 2008, if I started talking to anybody about this concept called Plain Song Farm, I would cry, and I didn't know why I was crying, and I didn't know what to do. So five years like that went by, and finally, in 2013, a concept emerged when I read the book Soil and Sacrament by Fred Bonson. And he described Adama Farm. Remember Adama from, yeah. a pro, it's a program of the Jewish organization Hazon. Should have put a slide about Adama up here. It's amazing, it still exists, it's still a program of Hazon. And it weaves together the agricultural year and the Jewish liturgical year. and incorporates a residential young adult program and it grows people along with fresh produce. The people that it grows go, are only there for 11 weeks. And after their time there, they become alumni, autobotics. And as they go out into the world, some become farmers and some become rabbis. And some work in nonprofits and some begin new organizations that weave together religious practice and ecological health. Now for five years, I had been wondering what God was calling me to do as I was crying about Plain Song Farm. And I literally read that book the day it came out on Kindle because I thought maybe it would have an answer to my question and I read about Adam and I was like, that's it. Because we don't have that in Christian world and we need that. I don't think we had it back then anywhere. So in the spring of 2014, I tried and failed to start Plain Song Farm. I started in May and in May, I knew I was failing. If you are going to fail, fail fast. <laughs> I just didn't, I didn't like taking care of my chickens. I had gotten chickens. I didn't like taking care of my garden. I had a garden. I was like, this is definitely not working. And I am the part of it that is not working. I got down on my knees on a pre like a good Episcopalian. And I, 
I said to God, I can't do this. I can't do this. If you want this done, you're going to have to do it. And if you do it, I will help. And God did it. I realized that to have a farm, we needed farmers to live there. And I asked God to show us another place to live. My husband, who did not know I had offered that prayer, <laughs> found a place he thought we could live. He just walked into where I was. I thought the piece of property listed that I thought we should look at. Okay. <laughs> we moved. Uh, the diocesan youth missioner introduced me to his friends who wanted to have a farm somehow connected to the church but lacked access to land and capital. They were in their 20s. People in their 20s don't have access to land and capital. Lots of them wanted to start farms. They still want to start farms. We did a lot of things that were beyond the scope of this lecture and by May of 2015 I handed the keys to, my, to that yellow house and $15,000 to Mike and Bethany Edwardson and they moved in. At the time, I was about 40, and they were in their mid to late 20s. This picture is actually a couple of years after we kind of like were like, oh, this is still here. We haven't failed yet. <laughs> we started taking pictures. <laughs> Before then, we had been working together. I remember driving away from that moment of handing over my keys and thinking that despite the fact that I had been in ministry for 20 years, this new thing that God was doing was already calling me toward more radical discipleship than I had ever imagined was going to be part of my life. In Acts, we read they had all things in common. I hadn't given all things, but giving use of a house at no cost and startup money was more than I was used to giving. But I had to, because despite the fact that we had the blessing of, I think, two bishops by then? You no, know, maybe only one, because the other one hadn't arrived yet? Anyway, there wasn't Episcopal Church funding uh, for that early stage. That next year, we accessed the only funding source available to us at that time, the ISIS of Western Michigan, everyone in Texas. Hmm. <laughs> um, please do good with what you have. That is what I said. Um, the next year we had from the Episcopal Church $20,000 spread over three years. Six, there were three of us and we had, uh, we had a lot of work to do because $6,667 per year was not enough. But you know what? All of those stories about God providing miracles actually turn out to be true. Not every time, but they have been true in my life. Plainsong Farm grew from three people and $15,000 in one house to hundreds of people and hundreds of thousands of dollars and two houses. And we even grew into knowing what we were doing. We exist to cultivate connections between people, places, and God as a place that nurtures belonging and the radical renewal of God's world. And I am afraid to say this, but also have to say it. At Plainsong Farm, God is remaking Christianity, and we are trying to help. Instead of a Christianity fractured between denominations, we didn't even talk about the Reformation in all of that analysis of 500 years ago, but we could have. I could have spent just as long on the Reformation. Instead of a Christianity fractured between denominations, and broken relationships between people and places. What I see happening, and I cannot take any credit for because I did not do it, God is remaking a Christianity that includes many people, well, not many people, people of many denominations, listening to and learning with one another and tending and caring for one place and trying to learn how that place is part of the healing of the world. Instead of a Christianity that has been displaced through the process of settler colonialism, God is remaking a Christianity that is integrated into a place that hopefully will touch the lives of many places. And instead of a Christianity that just gives handouts of charity without asking questions about our tradition and how we contributed to the problems that we're trying to solve, we are trying to figure out how to acknowledge our tradition's brokenness and our own need for healing. At its root, the climate crisis is a crisis of culture. 
Culture leads to policy. Policy can't solve climate change alone. At the root of every crisis of culture is a crisis of religion. And in the 1400s and 1500s and 1600s, people who genuinely believed they were following Jesus lost sight of what religion's purpose was. I am going to, I, the world in which we live today is shaped by their choices and the tragedy that their lack of vision left us. So at Plain Song Farm, we're trying to see differently. We have to see the people who were on the land before us, the Anishinaabe people who were living there for generations before European settlement began in 1838. We have to see the people that are there now. Uh, I always show this slide whenever I show pictures of Plain Song Farm because my, all of my pictures of Plain Song Farm are full of white people. And it's important for people to understand that, see where it says Rockford and all of the dots around it are blue? That is because North Kent County, where I am, is full of white people, 99% white. What we are is a living laboratory growing local resilience and equity. We're exploring faith and place, and we're serving the health of all creation. Can we see ourselves? I love your description of us as an experiment. That's truly what I feel that we are. Um, and we have been an experiment since I got in this permanent relationship with people. Mike and Bethany came from the evangelical world. They were alumni of Cornerstone University. And that is not a world that I understood very well, and neither did they understand mine. And yet, both of us were called into this work together, and we could only do it with each other. And that is something that God did, that laid a foundation that I think we need laid. Um, so what I have to, we have never get to Q&A unless I stop talking. Um, <laughs> so in this place, we have both a living laboratory farm where we grow fresh produce. Uh, we grow it ecologically for climate resilience and we distribute it for health equity. We work with three community partners, two food pantries, and an equity model membership-based grocery store. At the, in the winter, we ask them to survey their members and clients to identify what the people who will eat our food actually want to eat. And in January, they place orders with us. So for example, this past year, we learned that the community food club, which serves people at 200% of the poverty level and below, didn't have a, a regular supply of fresh cilantro. But fresh cilantro was an herb that their members needed and appreciated. So we're growing a consistent supply of fresh cilantro for the community food club. Our crop plan, which Mike manages, is based on our partner agency's needs. That's, we are here to serve them. The produce is planted and tended and harvested with volunteers and visitors who learn as they grow. This is, for an example, this is an interfaith youth group that came uh, to visit us during a summer camp in 2019. And we have an Episcopal Service Corps. This is our current cohort. Um, we are recruiting for 2023. Please tell your friends that are under 30 and over 21 that we would love to have them for a year. But to me, the things that I find most interesting are the liturgical and religious side, and you're a seminary audience, so I can talk to you about those things. Um, <laughs> first of all, we gather on Sunday afternoons throughout the summer for an experience known as Sabbath at the farm. Unfortunately, I don't have a great picture. Imagine a lot of people in a circle outside on blankets, then this happens afterwards, the potluck afterwards. Sabbath at the farm is liturgically rooted, but it doesn't include communion. It always includes a reading from the Bible. It always includes all ages together the whole time. It always includes a question for shared reflection. It always includes a hands-on experience that relates somehow to God's creation. It always includes prayer, and it always has a potluck. And I remember one Sunday looking around and noticing that one of the people that had come to Sabbath at the farm was an Old Testament professor at Cornerstone University a place where the ordination of women is still a matter for debate. And another was an agnostic who attended church nowhere at all and probably whose religion was the Democratic Party. <laughs> Sabbath at the farm fed both of their souls. And I will say, Sabbath at the farm, we did it in 2019, it grew to, in about 12 weeks to about 50 people, we canceled it in 20, 
did it once a month in 2021, and both times it was like 50 people within a summer. It kind of blew my mind, and it was the youngest group of people I had ever seen gather in 20 years, in more than 20 years of ministry, because there were so many kids. So we also, you know, I, I could go, I feel like I'm gonna skip this part about our governance. Okay, so we've taken a lot of pictures at Plain Song Farm, but these two are my favorites. So this is a picture of people kneeling to pray and touching the earth before the first time we planted heirloom wheat. We, are, we got an heirloom wheat program that came to us from Honoré Farm and Mill in California, the work of Elizabeth Duruff. And this was before the first planting, we prayed knowing we were one with the soil and giving thanks for the soil. Without the soil of the earth, none of us would be here today. How often do we give thanks for soil? I had never given thanks for soil before. That made no sense. Then this is a picture of the people going in for the harvest at the first heirloom wheat harvest. Um, we ended up using this a portion of this for communion bread. So uh, the guy in the yellow shirt is the Lutheran pastor. A uh, woman in the pink shirt is the Methodist pastor. A uh, guy in the blue shirt is the Episcopal priest. A woman in the purple handkerchief, Episcopal laywoman. And this was a ceremonial first cutting of these sheaves before we went in and tried to get as much as we could. In this field, it did not matter that some of us were Methodists and others of us were Episcopalian. What mattered was that we were hungry. We we're hungry for the bread that nourishes our bodies, but we're also hungry for the bread of life that feeds our souls, the bread that is Christ. These are some more pictures from previous Blessing the Fields liturgies. This is our Rovation days. We've done this with vestments and without, with communion and without, but every May we have a public liturgy where we walk the farm and pray for the coming growing season. This was the circle in 2019. And with all, along with all this local work, we are working to shift practices of faith toward healing for people and planet on a national level. In 2020, our church lands program brought together 15 Episcopal churches from 12 states, all of whom were seeking to use their land more wisely, because it turns out that the way that we tend land impacts climate. It can mitigate climate, um, it, yeah, it can conserve biodiversity. It, it can make food systems more resilient. But the way that we do it always integrates scripture and the teacher of the Bible for that is my partner in that work, uh, the Reverend Dr. Daryl Harris, who just got his doctorate this past year from Johns Hopkins. Um, and this is him leading our group in Bible study. In 2021, the current year, 2021-22, we're running a ministry innovators cohort supporting new ecological ministries that help people connect faith practice and care of creation. And people from Georgia to Minnesota are participating because the, the hunger that they have is to not be alone in trying to do the thing that God has called them to do and they don't know how it works. I can provide companionship for this. This is a fallen world and in it we inherit the sins of our ancestors. And these sins give us the illusion of separation from the ground underneath our feet, from the birds that inhabit our skies, and the microbes on which our life depends. And these sins cause us to believe that we have to do more and better and faster to be worthy. But this is also a blessed and redeemed world in which the author of all life came to dwell a mortal human. It is a holy world. And through grace, we inherit the spirit to transform us as fire transforms forests, burning down old growth so that new growth might spring forth. As we inherit the choices our ancestors made, the most important questions is what choices we are making that our descendants will inherit from us. In Genesis, we read of our ancestor Abraham. I'm almost done. Abraham is promised that if he leaves behind everything he knows and faces into an unknown future, he will bless those who come after him. It is our turn to be Abraham. It is our turn to follow God's call to step forward in faith. We don't do that leaving a place. We do that loving a place.
place, staying where we are and living differently. We know that what we are doing is not working. We know that the culture we live in is hurting people in places that God made. We know that Christians help shape our broken culture. We know that Christians are needed to shift it toward hope and healing. And as Abrahams in our day, we need to return to the knowledge given to our first parents. This is a garden plan that has enough for everyone when we are humble enough to stay within the limits that God sets. Jesus Christ resisted the unholy one in the desert because he was baptized into belovedness. And that's what we inherit, the belonging and belovedness of Christ. And that's what you who are going out into the world to proclaim the grace of Christ as clergy, your people want to hear that. They want you to connect it for them to their day-to-day -day work and how they can be part of healing problems. There are plenty of problems. What we do as church is at the heart of the climate crisis. It's at the heart of how we got here, and it's at the heart of how we move on. And I would be remiss in my duties as the executive director of Plainsong Farm if I did not say to you, the reason that we can do any of these experiments at all is because of people who give us funding, because we don't get any normal funding from any institution. We don't have, we are not Texas. <laughs> <laughs> and so I would be remiss in my duties if I did not ask you to become supporting members at Plainsong Farm. We are hoping to create an online community that will help other people doing experiments like ours connect to one another. We are hoping to do that yet this year. And so I, I hope that some of you, if you feel called to be part of work like this, will want to be part of that. And that's what I have to say about that. I have not told you anything about what one step options you might have. And that is on purpose because I want to get to your questions and I had about a thousand words of 10 options and I deleted them because I was like, I can send those to people later. Also, it's a good marketing move. <laughs> so I think it will work. This is the part that's not a good marketing move. I think it will work if you text 616-266-0144 to me. That's my personal uh, work number. I will send you 10 options for what you might consider doing in your community of faith that would help your church, if it's a normal standard church, to take one step forward. Because there are lots of things that we can do and that we need to do. And most places are not Plains on Farm, and we don't need most places to be Plains on Farm. But I hope that you have come to understand why I feel we need Plains on Farm, and I hope you will feel that too. I think that that is the time for me to move to Q and A. Thank you, Reverend Parrish. We will now shift gears to the Q&A conversation led by our very own Clinton S. Quinn Professor of Systematic Theology, Dr. Anthony Baker. <laughs> Dr. Baker will get the conversation started and you are invited to join the conversation with your questions. Our friends Ashley and Lisa are, will be on either side with microphones. Please use the microphone so that our viewers on live stream can hear your questions. And for our live stream viewers, you are invited to join the conversation by submitting your questions on the chat, and then I will read your questions aloud. Hi, from me, good evening. Um, and uh, I better sort it off while I'm having a little bit of it. Let's talk a little bit while we get this uh, sorted. First of all, just thank you. Thank you so much for um, for the words that you brought to us, um, for the presence and the spirit that you brought to us. Um, I was my, my charge is to begin Q and A, but I sort of feel like I want to call an altar call. For the <laughs> yeah, um, I did my job. Yeah, you have, you have done your job. Well. How are we doing, Dave? I feel a sense of okay. I did what I came here to do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was uh, it was um, 
just really beautifully done and beautifully presented and really um, quite compelling. Um, and I thought maybe before I start with a question, I would just um, uh, go over some of my favorite moments that you shared with us, or put some of what were for me the highlights. Um, your line, uh, the sort of the, the grew into another line, the, the line about uh, we are still in Eden and, and showing no restraint. That there was something so powerful, hopeful, and so sad, sort of at the same time. Um, maybe because we're getting ready to, well, Eden, in our, you know, in our Christian story, that's the place we left. We are no longer there, so, you know, ways of relating to the earth as, as, the, as that as creation, in that sense, no longer apply. But then you sort of put the charge back like, oh, no, we're still there. And we're still making those same mistakes. That was just a, that was a powerful moment for me. Um, uh, then um, noting the way that this all feels so overwhelming, uh, and, and, and you just sort of didn't let us off the hook and you kept going. You said, what can I do? That's not a question of discipleship. And you know, so we'll pause. We need to sit with that for like 15 minutes and just think about what you just said to us. Um, discipleship is about something else. Discipleship is about participating in something miraculous. Exactly. And letting ourselves be shut down from by, by that sort of question is just, it's a, it's a discipleship problem. And that was a profound sort of way of, of framing that for, for me. Um, uh, the way that you talk about belonging uh, reminded me a lot of the way that um, uh, Will James Jennings does in his book on uh, Christian imagination. He talks about the, the, the one of the real losses uh, in in white European uh, Christianity and migration, beginning from some of the same critical goals that you were that you were talking about. The real loss is a sense of belonging, um, and when you when you when you don't see yourself as belonging to a place. And you begin to see your see place as something that you can own. The first thing that goes, the first thing that you lose any any sort of it, it, that you lose track of entirely is the wisdom of the place. Just that way of sort of so clearly sort of walking us to see that to see that historical problem, name the way that it sort of sits with us. There's something beautiful and profound about that. Um, I have lots of other highlights, but let's go into a question and we'll, and we'll open it up for others. Um, one of the things that uh, I um, sort of the, the, the theological frame of this question is Pelagianism. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> but here's what's inside that theological frame: uh, all this sort of overwhelming sense of um, of the, the countercultural sense of what you're doing. Um, it it's for 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 most people who are no longer in their twenties, it feels like a lot. And maybe for people who are still in their twenties, um, and so many times I find that trying to talk about trying to talk about a new way of relating to climate change, a new way of relating to economy, a new way of relating to place, feels like to others that you are that we are just sort of giving them a long list of things to do, and say, here if you want to if you want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Here's 12 things to add to your to-do list. And then people say, that's great, my to-do list is full. Um, and that's as far as the conversation goes. So my question to you is, how do you, how do you combat that in the work that you do? How do you combat the sense of this reframing of discipleship as, as, as about belonging to a place and as, as, as caring for, for, as blessing soil? Uh, how do you combat a sense, um, maybe in yourself or maybe among others, that this is twelve more things you put on your view list when you get a when you get a spare moment? That's a, I mean, it's a great question. It's um, like I put a lot of things on my own to do list to, to be able to do all of that, um, not alone, and so. What I've found is having having gone in that direction, instead of I'm, I'm not trying. I actually am not trying to convince anyone. I'm trying to keep up with the number of people that are interested, and, which is quite different from when I had a. I mean, some of the things that I noticed for the few first few years of playing Tom Farm, I was also serving a congregation, and because you know no funding, and also I loved this congregation as a little church, 
And one of the things that I noticed was people would come to the farm or they would find out about the farm and then they would go, hey, this same person that's doing this farm thing is also at this church. And so um, and simultaneously as this farm was growing, then also this church was growing. I actually have never, I, 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 I'm, I don't know that I've had the problem of trying to convince people. I'm trying to keep up with the people that are already convinced and want something for me to help them to do what they already feel called to do. Yeah. I don't, I mean, but I remember thinking, I mean, I remember having that other experience, which was before I started doing this. Before I started doing this, I was like, how do I persuade these people? There's so much that they have to change. But then I just, then I just completely changed everything I did. <laughs> and then, then, that, then I didn't have to worry about that anymore. Yeah. That's making me think too of the way that you talked about the, your, your um, I don't know, what kind of epiphany that you had in the midst of the work where you, your prayer, where you said, you got down on your knees and said, I can't do this. If you and this done. You're gonna have to do it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. be Just, very careful. Yeah. yeah, so that testimony to me is a powerful sort of, um, yes, the work is enormous and it's God's work that we get to join in. Right? That's exactly right. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. right. What are the questions that folks got that you want to that you want to that you want to share? Give a wave and call for a microphone. Hello, Mother Parish. Thank you so much for your lecture. You're such a rock star. <laughs> human. That's just me. I'm just human. I'm your friend. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm uh, the Reverend Sarah Smith. I'm a deacon in the Diocese of Oklahoma. And I'm working with maybe one of your colleagues, Christian Barron in West Michigan. Love Christian Barron! In the Order of St. Lucretius, using uh, awesome. hunting and fishing to feed people and yep. teach people about creation care and sustainable eating and protein. So I was just wondering, in light of my passion, um, do you guys think about wildlife management? Because I don't think you can talk about land management. And no, that's your job, Order of <laughs> <laughs> I, but I, I, I think about it, but I, I'm not going to do anything about it. <laughs> okay. But you have land, and I'm sure there's wildlife around, and I wonder, just, you know, what, so, I'm sure you come to some conversation. Sarah, we're about to come shoot something. <laughs> <laughs> I will eat it and feed it to everyone. <laughs> Which we're doing for Easter, by the way. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay, well, uh, we'll have to talk later. Um, we participate in the Kent Conservation District's um, kind of soil conservation work. So we are, you know, planting native trees, and we're creating. But in terms of the the life that walks across our land, the deer, um, we just keep them out of the vegetables. <laughs> That's bad. and you know there uh, there is wildlife on the property because it's fairly rural, and West Michigan has plenty of wildlife. But we haven't. You know, there's, we're a small organization, um, and so we don't have like structured programs of care for wildlife. We are caring for vegetables <coughs> and plants. But I always wonder how we could partner more intentionally with the Order of Necratius. <laughs> I'm wondering if any, if you have been working with or talking with anyone um, in an urban setting where there are food deserts and, and people who are interested maybe in growing food in an urban environment and um, and also how one would partner in that kind of maybe exchange so I think one thing I would say is in a lot of the food conversation instead of the term um, food desert which is which it kind of implies a naturally occurring um, like people not having access to healthy food is a natural occurrence. Uh, the activist Karen Washington pioneered the use of the term food apartheid, saying that these are structured situations that have been intentionally designed. Now, you know, they may have been accidentally designed, but at any rate, they're certainly designed. Um, with, with that, there are a lot of urban agriculture folks that um, some of whom are faith-based, many of whom are not. And they are working very hard at increasing access to healthy produce it did, you know in every country every city around the country one of the things that i consistently see is people who are seeking access to land in order to begin work of related to food justice and i would say that's particularly true for bipoc folks 
who don't have the same access to land as the descendants of European settlers. So one thing that Episcopal churches can do is make land available for agriculture, whether that's um, in rural or suburban or urban contexts, um, and engage in equitable and just relationships with people that might be using the land. Um, one of the many interesting experiences that I have had, um, well, I don't, we don't have time for me to tell this whole story, but was getting to know a young farmer who started farming on Episcopal church land um, was not so well treated by the Episcopal church and ended up farming on Catholic land. Um, there's not a great witness when that happens. So, and when you are a landowner, you have many decisions, many of which you do not understand if you are the descendant of European settlers. You do not, um, unless you're intentionally engaged in growing food, you are not going to know that you need water access and you know all of these things. So I would say there are a lot of ways that the Episcopal Church can be more intentional about our land in way, and in our, in our kitchens um, and all of these infrastructure that we have that would increase access and equity but we don't tend to think about those with our religious brains on. Somehow we tend to think about those as like the social action committee's job. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand why, because theologically there is a table at the middle of what we do, because that's what Jesus did. And so I don't understand why there's not a table at the middle of everything we do. Didn't answer your question. I kind of went off on a rant, but it kind of no, answered that's okay. It's, it was informative and diocese of Texas, which so I heard you clearly. <laughs> I have a question from a viewer, Kristen Braun. Can you tell us more about who participates in your program, who benefits by getting produce, and how people are chosen for that? In other words, how do you find your people? So that's a Great question, thank you. Um, there's our, our equity and resilience programs in terms of the end user of the produce, the can, person that's gonna eat the food. We partner with agencies that do the work of thinking through who they serve. So we are partnered with the closest, uh, geographically closest uh, poverty relief and development agency North Kent Connect, we've been partnered with them from the beginning. We've always contributed food to, for their pantry. And they serve our entire region, and they have caseworkers and programs that are meant for people, and we just kind of bring food into that. Then, right before the pandemic, we found out that there was a food pantry at the community college because the community college had done a study and identified that there was food insecurity in the community college, which was news to me. The chaplain came. And cha the chaplain discovered us and said, do you think that you might be willing to provide food to the Grand Rapids Community College Food Pantry? And we said, we didn't even know Grand Rapids had a food pantry at the community college. So we started providing food to them. And so they serve that to the, they provide that to the community college students. And then we had been running a community supported agriculture program where we were serving paying customers. And then we tried to convert it to a sliding scale. And then we discovered that the sliding scale was not effective and that we really just wanted to take in the other leap of faith uh, that donors were gonna support us giving food away as our whole, like everything we did with food. And we, and at that point we needed another distribution partner and we found the Community Food Club, which if you're interested in emergency food, you should check out the Community Food Club in Grand Rapids, Michigan. It is a different model that is based on a membership where if you are at 200% of the poverty level or below, you can qualify for a membership. You pay 10 to $15 a month for that membership, and then you shop with points. So it's a grocery store experience. It's a dignified grocery store experience. And with your points, you have you can get 100 to 100, I can't, 100 to $150 of food. And so we provide produce to them, and we're filling in the gaps in their supply chain that we can provide um, that others don't because everything else that they get is like donated from farmers and so they have peaks and valleys. Um, that's the who eats the food. The program that we offer, the practicing faith in place, is a people have found us um, and we found people, but there is a real hunger for ecologically integrated practice of faith, at least in West Michigan. 
And so when you put it out there, people come to it. Um, I mean, you have to do things like, I went to the Watershed Association and started talking to people and that, you know, they discovered we existed and, you know, things went from there. But um, it's, a, it's a wide range of people, but that, that's their, they're ecologically committed and they are, want to have a relationship with God. So my question for you is, um, how do you deal with or process um, kind of the grief of knowing, like for example, the IPCC report that came out that said, you know, we've already passed certain thresholds on climate change that are now kind of irreversible, and like knowing that some of the people that are going to start seeing the effects here very soon and very severely are some of the same people who have contributed the least towards the climate crisis. So how do you uh, handle that? Uh, I mean, I know for me it's like whinging about it to my therapist every two weeks, but I feel like that's not a really long-term sustainable <laughs> model. So what's your kind of processing of that? That's a wonderful question, and thank you for naming it. Um, I don't think I have a great coping strategy. I work too much. So it is it's some, this, this um, it is what I have done. It's what I've done mo much of my life. Um, and it's a way that I avoid feeling the feelings. Um, I'm not going to recommend it, but you ask me what I do and that's what I do. <laughs> I have a question from a viewer, Nathan Auber. Why does the domination theology continue to have such a strong hold on so many Christian churches despite the myriad of verses in the Bible that show a different relationship to creation and despite worshiping a God that calls us to love and to have the fruits of the Spirit? Nathan Auber, you know the answer to that question. <laughs> 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 um, well, I guess, I, I, um, we need to evangelize better, you know? I mean, that's, who who is going to who is going to be loud if not us you know and why is that why is that theology so well known we haven't been very loud I don't know about you but I I my culture has been my Christian culture has been like it's okay to be Christian it's fine you know keep that private because you might offend someone and so then the people who are very uh, dedicated to converting the world are the people that have the theology of dominion. Mm -hmm. Well, I have to become a more public Christian. And so does Nathan. I mean, Nate, we're both working on it. Nathan, and I, I'm not picking on you. But <laughs> and, and we all have to become public Christians who, who are willing to stand up to the capital ministries of the world and say, that's not the gospel. And here's why. And for that, we need theological education. Yeah. So thank you, seminaries. And, and that, for that, we need educated clergy who will educate congregations. And we need a lot of Bible study. I mean, we, we need a lot of religious work done. Including by Nathan. <laughs> you sort of already answered the question, but picking back, picking back on the um, issue of evangelizing better, how do we form parishioners, or how do we help them become disciples who care about the care of creation? I think you you show them, and I don't think you ha and I think you better not try to be perfect about it because you can't be and I think you show them your stumbling faltering efforts I don't know the name of most birds you know and so if you follow me on Instagram you will have found me asking if anybody else that follows me knows the name of a bird that was nesting in my um, my uh, porch light and I'm kind of embarrassed about the fact that I don't know the names of the birds that live in the place where I live but I don't, and the only way I'm going to know them is if I try to learn about them. And so, I mean, it's thing, it's things like the fact that that's something you, if you, if that's something you care about, your people will care about what you care about. Another 
question from a viewer. Katie Bull says, this all makes me think about not only the churches that have unused land, but the many people that might be willing to lend land to ministries that people want to get going. This, there is so much underutilized land. I'm wondering how can we partner with landowners in order to do this kind of work? That is, uh, that was DO 2018 a general convention resolution. <laughs> um, that I uh, still has lots of work to be done on it. Um, my answer to that is there is there are already people who are non-religious general often working on soil and water conservation everywhere in the United States. And that's one of the things in my one step thing that, that I'll send you if you tech, if that whole texting thing works. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and so they are often looking for land. And we often have land that we don't know what to do with. I mean, there's a lot of people that are looking for the assets that the church holds. And often we find ourselves kind of living within our buildings going, where are all the people? And when we get out of our normal and we start going to meetings where we don't know anyone, it's really, um, it gives us the opportunity to enter into partnerships. So one of our biggest partners, so much more helpful, I am being recorded, than the Episcopal Church was, um, <laughs> <laughs> I said it anyway, um, was the Lower Grand River Organization of Watersheds. They totally, without them, I don't think, I don't know whether Plains on Farm would exist. Um, they were like, oh, you want to be an educational farm where kids and youth and adults can learn about how we take care of the watershed? Wow, we don't have any farms like that. We want to help you become that kind of farm. We'll write grant for you. That was not something that in many of the others were doing. Um, and we'll partner with you to create environmental education programs. And that helped us. That helped us in so many ways. They were looking. They were looking for things that the church already has. You know, land and people that care. Start. <clears throat> one of the uh, one of the points in your talk that really struck me was when you were uh, speaking about the lawn in Las Vegas and the Episcopal Church and saying of both, um, someday this is going to stop working. And you're discovering some things about um, what to do when the lawn in Arizona stops working. Are you also discovering things about what to do when the Episcopal Church stops working? I don't know yet. Um, partly because I don't know what the Episcopal Church will do with the things that we've discovered. <laughs> but I will say, um, whether or not, you know, whatever happens in the Episcopal Church, I have definitely feel like I have we, God, I don't know, I have watched as discipleship is practiced across generations in a way that cares for creation that didn't used to be there. And, and if that, that is effectively helping parents transmit faith to children in a way that wouldn't have been done the same way, or maybe at all. <coughs> so I hope the Episcopal Church wants to learn from Thank you. Time is up. We've been uh, had a delayed start, so we're eating into our dessert reception time. <laughs> but before we move over there, Reverend Parrish, please come join me right here in the center stage. On behalf of the seminary community, we want to thank you for the gift of your presence and sharing your wisdom with us. Please accept this gift as our token of our appreciation. And I also want to recognize the Harvey committee members, Ashley Colley, Louise Rivas, Lisa Lewis, and faculty liaison, the Reverend Dr. Dan Jocelyn Semyakoski. <laughs> please join us up front and center, please. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I also want to thank a few others who made this event possible, especially Dr. Anthony Baker, 
Director of Communications, Eric Scott, and the fabulous Hospitality Events Coordinator, Ashley Croshaw. Please come join us up here. Oh, I have to take pictures of it. <laughs> so now we have the perfect photo op. We'll do this again when not everyone is watching. <laughs> All right, good. All right, so thank you for joining us today, and I will close us out with prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Bountiful God, we call up, you call us to labor with you in tending the earth. Where we lack love, open our hearts to the world. Where we waste, give us discipline to conserve. Where we neglect, awaken our minds and wills to insight and care. May we, with all your creatures, honor and serve you in all things. For you live and reign with Christ, Redeemer of all, and with your Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please join us in the dining hall for the dessert reception. Thank you. Thank you.